I'm happy that uh, you came to uh, join a seminar by Kim Lefmans. So Kim uh, is in his PhD at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, uh, after which he did postdoc at Helsinki University of Technology before uh, venturing in a more than decade long period of working at the Lisa National Lab. Uh, who's now already for 16 years or so, <laughs> working at the University of Copenhagen as a professor in physics uh, in uh, neutron uh, scattering. So I now came from doing my postdoc uh, with him before coming here. Um, so I'll say for yours and uh, happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Matt. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for inviting me, Michael, and, and <coughs> thanks to you for showing up. Um, I, I wouldn't actually say, Matthew, that you did your postdoc with me. I think we 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 worked together. You did your postdoc with me? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I, mean, I never really felt you like uh, as a minion or anything. Uh, if you know, Matthew, don't go there. Um, anyway, I was uh, I was asked to give you an introduction to what to what I'm doing. The field, my my field of research is neutron scattering. Now I say neutron scattering for quantum materials. Of course, quantum materials is a very broad thing. Neutrons, neutrons cannot see everything, uh, like other techniques have, have its limitations. So when I'm saying quantum materials, I'm talking about magnetic properties of materials that are found in bulk. We are not we we are not into completely uh, monolayers of atoms. Neutrons cannot see that. It's not the proton Um so that's what I'm going to, to, to talk in the beginning. Then I will give just a few examples from my own group, uh, what we have been doing with, with Newton techniques back in the days and lately. Um, I will tell you a little about the, the perspective for the future, which I think is are very bright these days when you're in, into Newton. But I'll come back to that later. Now, um, when you do experiments on magnetic materials, you want to measure the properties, and of course, you know all this. We have to measure the resistivity, of course, the magnetization, susceptibility, and all that. There are a number of microscopy techniques that you are also working into. There's a number of advanced spectroscopy techniques where you see changes in energy levels with tunnel microscopes, NMR, X ray, uh, electron spin resonance, neurons. For me, the neutrons is really the thing. That I go to, it, it's it's um, it's a technique that requires some level of speciality. So then, when you, as me, have spent a whole, well, a whole a whole career in this, you 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 tend to uh, to use this as a uh, as a tool. But of course, you should never be blind that that other people can do complementary work. But this is not on me. This is this is on like, guys like you that have that expertise elsewhere, and then we can hopefully find some projects to collaborate. Um, neutron is a nuclear particle. Uh, you probably know this already. It has mass like like a proton. It's electrically neutral. That means it can easily penetrate into material. Um, but when it sees a nucleus, it will scatter, like like on, like on the picture here. It also makes nuclear reactions. We are not going in that direction, but we are taking scattering. Uh, the neutron basically changes direction. But of course, as we are using slow neutrons, slow means like a thousand kilometers uh, per hour, thousand meters per second, whatever unit you want to buzz in that ballpark. Um, this this relative slowness means that we shouldn't uh, consider the neutron as being a particle. Really, it's much more like a wave. So we get interference ranges. Like this is just a photograph of water waves through two holes, but it's the same thing happening. And it's, by the way, also the same thing that happens with X-rays. Interference between scattering for axons, in this, in this case, nuclei. But there's, there's another thing with the neutron is that it has a magnetic moment, although being neutral, electrically neutral, it consists of three quarks, and the three quarks have different magnetic moments. Altogether, there is a net magnetic moment out of that. And that magnetic moment can feel or interact with atomic magnetic moments, and therefore, neutron scattering is, is very sensitive to magnetism. Actually, equally sensitive to, to, to magnetic structure as to nuclear structure. Can I ask, uh, what is the typical wavelength of your neutrons in this 1,000 meter per 
per second rate. This is a one to ten angstroms. This is you, you. You can go a little below that. You can go a little above the, this. But this is the range we work with. So it's very typical, same as X-rays. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's also another thing is when when you have neutrons with this wavelength, they will have energies of from one to two hundred milli electron volts. Yeah. So that's also energies that are quite typical in, in condensed matter, and therefore. What we used to say is that we can measure material structure and dynamics, magnetic structure and dynamics. Those are kind of the four things we, we are after. Um, the breadth of Newton research is, 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 is very huge. Um, Newtons are used for engineering, so measuring stress strain relations in construction materials uh, to see. To, to look into industrial components, see how see how liquid flows inside a um, um, fuel cell, oxide fuel cell, to, to look into archaeological items without destroying them. Um, that's a lot of things within, within biotechnology, because neutron sees hydrogen very strongly. I will not go more into that. Um, transport medicine, of course, the, the bottom, the bottom Left corners where we are, uh, quantum spins and new materials, and then there are full things. Energy materials can also be used for catalysis to study. Uh, uh, and I know, and I know that, that 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 many of you guys are strongly into catalysis, but I just have to make this disclaimer that I'm not going to show catalysis examples because I don't know enough about them. Um, so this is this is. Slide, this is slide, uh, I promise it's my only slide for the questions. Um, but we just need to get a few things straight. We have we have the Bragg law, as you all know, uh, relates wavelengths to the to the scattering angles through through the lattice spacing. We have to define the wave number as two pi over lambda. And instead of scattering angle, we often talk about the cube vector, which is the difference between the K incoming, the green one here, and the KF, the outgoing. I can see I made it green, it should have been red, obviously. And therefore Q comes like this. It's the big, it's the big black one. This is Q. And if you work work around it, Bragg's law in this uh, uh, in 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 this way, in, in reciprocal space as we call it, is simply that Q equals two pi over D, which is the reciprocal space. In, when we do inelastic neutron scattering, when the neutron changes energy, we have to we have to take one more thing into account, and this is that the energy transfer, sometimes called S bar omega, sometimes called E, it's not the consistency between papers, but this is the difference between the ingoing and the outgoing outgoing energy. Um, so we have the two central uh, quantities Q and E. And if you combine them, um, you will you will have to. Oh, I sorry, I have to rewind slightly. I have to take take this, this into account. Here we have the neutron scattering from a material, giving off energy, and that energy has gone into creating a quasi particle, some vibration, lattice vibration, the magnetic vibration, the blue one here in the material, that has a Q. And then from the energy conservation, we can say that the energy given off by the neutron is the same as that taken off by the torsion particle. And momentum conservation tells us that the two Qs are equal. And therefore, we can measure the dispersion relation between the, um, the corresponding points of Q and E at the same time. And what Qs and E's are we talking about? Uh, on this also little busy slide, it's, it's this range. We're talking about Q in reciprocal angstroms, or if you may, this is in real space, something like 1,000 angstroms, 100 nanometers. We go here. I think we can go a little further to the left. And then different particular techniques, different particular instruments, then move along here, and we can go all the way in from an one nano electron volt up to one electron volt in, in, in energy transfer, but not at the, at the same instrument. We need 
four or five tiers of instruments to cover the bridge. Um, <coughs> typically, people have experience with x-rays and not neutrons. And that's completely understandable because you have x-rays in every lab. I saw your x-ray equipment here earlier this afternoon. And of course, because it's, it's a lot cheaper, neutrons are made just at a few, like a few handfuls of dedicated sources worldwide. So it's both, both tedious and expensive. So you should have good reasons for doing research as, at such expensive facilities. One thing I already talked to you about is that the energies are much in the range of, of the, of the um, typical excitation energies in, 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 in solids. And therefore, it's easy to get a relatively good resolution. X-rays can do spectroscopy also on millielectron volt scales, but with a resolution of typically one millielectron volt, whereas neutrons easily go go to the micro, much of the microelectron volt range, and sometimes below that. So uh, a little catchy neutron tells you where the atoms are and what the atoms do. Is 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 what they said when they awarded uh, the Nobel Prize. For, for, to, to Sean and Brockhaus for the invention of neutron scanning technique. This is just an example of a clathrate material that we studied where it was essential to know the lattice vibrations with high precision. And I'll come back to that example actually later. Um, another good thing is that the neutron goes through, um, goes through the periodic table randomly, or I'd rather say erratically, it's not random because it's, it's the same from, from from Monday to Tuesday, right? Um, but, but not on Wednesday. Sorry? But not on Wednesday. <laughs> of course not. Um, no, so so um, so different neighboring elements can have very different scattering ampl amplitudes. One of the strongest scattering amplitudes is, is for hydrogen. Uh, that's 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 extremely nice in particular in organic chemistry. But even more important is that the the scattering amplitude changes sign between hydrogen and deuterium. So if you have some polymer in aqueous solution, it may have almost the same contrast as, a, as the solvent. So it would just to the scatter to the probe, it would look something like this. But changing over um, to deuterated water, bang, you have the polymer here. This is just very, uh, a very simple example, but you can actually contrast match Dif difficult things like uh, an organic nano device to, um, I think it's meant to carry some some poisonous drug, some some some, some, some cancer killing drug like right? chemotherapy inside this, and then this moves around in the body until it finds the cancer and then it opens. Uh, you want you you want to get machines like this. <laughs> I I don't I, 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 I don't know too too much about it, but they can. But you know, they can really, by contrast matching uh, between hydrogen and deuterium, they, they can zoom into the individual parts of this. Um, so, for, for what reason is neutron scattering so dependent on the elements in your. Like, I, I can see that the, the mass of the element is larger, the duration depends on the, between it, but like you say, it, it seems to depend irrevocably on. Light. Yeah, it's because it's scattered through, through the strong force. And, and not electromagnetic forces. Okay. It scatters electromagnetically when it's when it's a magnetic system, mm -hmm. but when it's when it's nuclei, it's it's the strong nuclear force, and that's really uh, very much dependent on the isotope. I think I think people have been able to to, to calculate the difference between between uh, hydrogen and deuterium, but for the the larger nuclei, it's just like uh, they they've completely given up on that and just say we measure this experimentally, and you can measure this with. Four or five leading digits or so. Okay, I'm curious because it was my question as well. So I would have thought, even with the strong force, that okay, the, the larger the, the, the nuclei is, the larger that say the cross section is for scattering. But you're saying it's not just the size of the nucleus that matters somehow. It's the composition of neutrons and protons. Oh, and okay, the, um, uh, I see. I see completely what you mean, but I was, but for many nuclei, we are actually we are actually looking at the tail of a resonance. So a Lorentzian tail coming off from somewhere in energy where we, where we just cannot reach. So, so, so there is a nuclear cross-section going on at kilo or mega electron volts. 
And then, you, and then, and then it has a Laurentian line that goes all the all the way into zero, and this is actually what goes into zero. It's not the peak that orbits, but the tails are doing. Okay. Something, something like this, and there is for deuterium. It's actually the peak of of deuterium turning into tritium that we we we, we see the tail of that peak. But but more details I don't know. Then then we need to go to to the to the nuclear physicist. Um. The neutron is actually a quite weak probe, even though I say it's a strong force. Uh, the nuclei are not very strong, so the, most of the material is, of course, empty. And um, integrating over volume, the neutron is a quite weak probe. Penetrates easily, uh, but also also the signal is, is weak, so it, 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 it has ups and downsides. But one of the upsides is that most of the scattering you see is only has only happened once, so there, there's very little most of the scattering in the neutron. So it's, so it's easy to quantitatively compare what you calculate to what you need. Um, and since it's highly penetrating, you can see inside the material. This is a this is a piece of meteorite from outer space. Uh, you see some a ring there, which is definitely hydrogen containing. So then the geophysicists can imagine that uh, there was a little grain, and then ice formed, and then and then more grains came, and then it, eventually the hydrogen is still there inside the rock. Um, it can also penetrate into big sample environments. This is a uh, this is a 15 tesla magnet with a split coil uh, standing on, on on a beam line. So the beam comes here. The beam is not on here. <laughs> the beam comes here, being reflected by a monochromator into the magnet, out from the magnet again, into the detector, which is this yellow tank. And this is a younger version of myself standing in a uh, hot summer afternoon at, at, in, in, uh, in northern Switzerland. And again, as I said, it's, it's magnetic, so you can see details in magnetic structure changes. This is a, this is a magnetoelectric material uh, through a phase transition induced, induced by an electrical field. Here is uh, actually an experiment from, from some of my students where they measure the magnetic dispersion relation in a uh, fairly complex material where they have the Q and the energy make a nice color plot and they can really very nicely see the dispersion relation. But, and also some side dispersion relation, relations that were unexpected, but that's another story. Um, so this is basically the five reasons why, why and when you want to neutron scattering. Um, and where and where this is uh, a uh, map from 10 years ago. I did this on purpose. This all, all the needles, that, that's where the neutron scattering facilities are in Europe. But I can now tell you that uh, Munich is closed, Berlin is closed, mm -hmm. I think Norway is closed, the Paris reactor is closed. Uh, not many of these are, are, are too small to actually make any difference. The ones that make differences, the, the really, really big ones, is the ILL in Grenoble. Uh, wonderful place, uh, really the most productive neutron source in the world. But unfortunately, it's members only, so you have to pay. Denmark pays. It took us a lot of effort to make the Danish government pay, but since the last, uh, I think, eight years, they have paid. Uh, Netherlands does, does not pay. So, so very you, sad. So you're actually, you're actually not allowed, only by collaboration. With KPR allowed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, Netherlands is a member of ISIS in the UK, which is almost as good neutral source. It's it's instruments <coughs> for technical reasons a little different, but let's let's uh, take that only later if, if if you're interested. So you actually have some preferred access to ISIS. So. So what's the big politics reason many of these have, centers have shut down them? Oh, is it just funding or is it something else? <coughs> many of these reactors were from the 1960s, uh, when when all the nuclear program boomed, and then many of the, the these reactors were made for nuclear power. Then you know reality uh, took over, and the nuclear power plants happened anyway. And what you use these reactors for, reactors for, and you turn them into nuclear facilities. And irradiation facilities and medical isotope production facilities and stuff like that. But when they are worn out, they will not be replaced because um, 
it's really the, the future is really is doesn't doesn't look nuclear when, when you look through a political lens. The other important facilities are the reactor in Munich. Sadly, it's not been running for the last four years due to a, ser due to a mixture of technical and political difficulties. Um, and then there's a the Porsche Institute in Switzerland where I go very often. The Swiss are very generous. You can just come in and use their facility. You don't need to pay anything. You just buy an application and, and off you go. So basically projects are selected from, from scientific data. <coughs> but then some of them have this extra um, have this extra option that you need to pay. But then there is a, there is a Dutch facility in Delft also. It's not a very big one, but it's there. And there is a, they, they, they have the, the reactor institute in Delft. They are complete experts in neutron scattering. And they would also, if you like to do neutron scattering, I think it's a good, uh, go and visit them and, and go talk to them. See if they can do it or if they can help you get access to ISIS. Um, we need to talk a little about neutron instruments, and then, and then I'm kind of back to back to my starting my postdoc career. This is all the guys that work with me, and there will be there will be more more pictures along the way. Eventually, they will change from being from being supervisors to being students. Um, this was the research reactor that that closed in the year 2000, where I worked. We had instruments like, like, like this on this picture, it looks very nice, but basically what happens is that the wide neutron beam comes in from the reactor, it hits a monochromator, which basically is a crystal, black slow selects one wavelength, here is our sample there, the sample does the scattering this direction, here is then another monochromator which we call the analyzer, that analyzes the wavelength, and off we go into the detector. It looks very much like the optical setup that, that, that you just showed me. It is the same setup. We call it we call it triple axis spectrometer because the neutron changes direction three times. There are also there are also instruments where the detector is there, and then you don't discriminate the energy. Uh, then you get more counts, but less precision. This is this is depending on what you want, what is the type of science you want to do. Um, when I, uh, just when I started, we were building a new spectrometer. That's the one you saw, the, the big yellow tank you saw the picture before, of course, of course known as Risa 2. It never came to run at Risa because just when it was finished, the, there was political turbulence and the reactor closed. So we shifted it to Switzerland. And it had this amazing, for the time, amazing progress that we had nine analyzers at the same time. So you could detect nine different scattering angles, and then you could make, well, nine times more points. So we made this, uh, this nice dispersion relation. This is, was the dispersion relation of the thermoelectric clathrate that I told you about before. The point was that these chemists had found out to grow these materials and found that they were very good thermoelectrics because the phonon heat conduction was very low. The question was why? And everybody in the field thought that was because of the short lifetime of the phonons. And we measured this, we measured the phonons. Here is one of the typical phonons, uh, the, one, the one where the, the, the gas atom inside the class rate is responsible for, for this. And this has a short lifetime. The, the line is completely narrow. It's, it's as, as narrow as, as, as the experimental resolution. There was no lifetime problem. So that was wrong. Instead, what actually happened is that there was an avoided crossing here. Eventually, it turns down. It, it decreases the, the velocity, uh, the group velocity of the phonons in much of the Brewing zone. And since the heat capacity goes with velocity squared, so not heat capacity, the heat, the, uh, the heat transport goes with velocity squared. And that was actually the reason. It, it, it completely gave this fact to you. Um, and we could only do it because we could. Uh, it was it was quite weak scattering, so we really had to had to use all the analysis to get this this, this nice picture. Um, another thing that could happen was completely um, serendipitous. Is that uh, Mr. Kenselman here was looking for um, a magnetic effect in 
in this uh, serum cobalt engine 5, which is a heavy thermal superconductor. And he didn't understand, he couldn't see a thing, but then, uh, but then, he, but then he, he was always looking at the middle signal, but then we kind of looked into the, 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 the other signals and suddenly there was something going on. So um, by chance, the other analyzers had, had covered the real signal that he was not expecting. So that's things you can happen when you get more pixels. Um, so these different detectors or, or analyzers, they would just come, collect different parts of the beam? And yeah, co collecting different parts of the scattered beam. If you look at so different angles, if you look right angles and scroll. if you look at this, you would have you would have one analyzer there and one and one there and one there and one there. So so kind of kind of. A semicircle analysis. And you would not normally expect that they would be picking up roughly the same signal because they're roughly in the same direction. But roughly in the same direction, but still like a degree apart. Yeah. And then it just happened that the signal he was looking for was so just a few degrees away. <laughs> so uh, it means that you have larger Q range where you can. Put yeah. Spectrum. So the larger Q range, the better, right? Yeah. So uh, I said this is this this is what we are doing now. Uh, this is the analyzer bank now for the Kamea spectrometer at PSI. Um, there, are, there are 800 analyzers. Are these scintillators? No, 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 these are just analyzers reflecting the beam and then the detectors are up here. Okay. Detectors are helium-3 tubes that works just like a guy can do a counter. Okay. But with, a, with an efficiency of roughly 90%, they, they are really good. Um, and this is some of the people working with us. Jonas here actually found out that by a clever trick, you could get eight, eight different channels out of, out of each crystal blade by, the tech, by, by measuring slight changes in right angle. So there are of the order 6,000 pixels coming out of this per measurement. So now we went from one pixel to, to 6,000 pixels. We should say that the intensity per pixel is down by perhaps a factor of 10 due to the beam is spreading out. But we have perhaps a 500 gain. Um, and then we can really get some nice things going on. Examples just in a second. Because this is why we're starting now. The examples. One of the things I'm interested in is superconductivity. And this is, again, the busy graph with the transition temperature versus here. I guess you've seen the picture before or something similar. But there was, you know, the big trend with the cool breaks in the 80s. Then came the iron-based superconductors in the zeros. And now <coughs> uh, room temperature has, or perhaps has not happened, uh, there's, there are some nature papers and some retracted nature papers, and I'm not going into this discussion at all. We can spend later. <laughs> um, but cool breaks, that's, that's the stuff I know about. It has basically this, this, this crystal structure. It's a perovskite. All of them, of course, have copper spin a half uh, in the planes connected by, connected by oxygens, and they, and they are strongly anti ferromagnetically coupled. We know that there are Cooper pairs in the cooperates, but unlike the known type 1 superconductors or BCS superconductors, we know that it's not a phonon coupled. This is very simple cartoon of a phonon coupled BCS Cooper pair. So it's not the phonons, but it could be the magnetic fluctuations. At least a series of theoretical works conclude that it, that this might be the case. So for that reason, it's interesting for us to study the magnetic fluctuations. So it's essentially a two-dimensional problem because the layers are almost on problem, not completely. Um, we, know, we know from a lot of extra and neutron studies that what happens uh, in the superconductors is that they will form stripes. Stripes look something like this. This is a two-dimensional copper oxide plane. This is, this is the individual copper spin. So there will be like anti-ferromagnetic orientation, and then 
every fourth role will then miss a uh, spin due to the due to the doping, and then there will be uh, antiphase jumping over here. So actually, the, the full magnetic unit cell has a period eight from here to here. So you will have magnetic diffraction peaks happening at a Q of one eighth plus the antiferromagnetic ordering vector. So you will have it like one eighth displaced from the normal antiferromagnetic black point, and this is what we see in this data very very nicely. Um, and we did at Riesen and and in, in, in the Berlin reactor that's also closed. We did a lot of nice uh, um, experiments of this back in the days with these nice people. Um, what we also found <coughs> is that the dispersion, um, so this is this is energy 10 to 40 million electron volts. The dispersion is vertically upwards initially, and then it bends over. And then when you go just above 40, it kind of completely merges here into something you know, strange, and then the dispersion goes outwards here. That's known as the hourglass feature if, you, if you're into this field. Um, but most importantly, from what I'm showing now, is just that it is vertical the first 10 million electrons. So that was what we knew from like year 2000. Then a new improved spectrometer opened at Bobert in, in Grenoble in 2016. We immediately went there to say, now we take our good old crystals and measure those again with a much better instrument. What happens? Here's the data. Green ones are the elastic scattering. This, this shows the, the static structure. The blue ones, scale blow, are the are, are from, are from, from the vibrations, vibrations of 1.5 millilectron volts. If you look carefully at them, they are not at the same period. You have to look carefully. But if you really do this, if you do the fitting well, you have to have a distortion looking like this. This is Q, very much zoomed in. This is energy. The elastic scattering is here. The fluctuations go like this. So, wow, this is not a goldstone mode. This is not a goldstone mode of this order because, because Q is discontinuous. So, it is two separate things. It comes from two separate, probably, from two separate parts of the crystal. One part is ordered, one part is not ordered. So, but, so this, is, this is not at all connected to spin waves or, or, or any other boson physics. That was, that was some surprise. That simply came directly from having the old samples on a new instrument that was far better than what we had before, at least in order of magnitude. So, can I, now how should I think about this? You're basically telling me something discontinuous is happening here. So if you could, like, if you could go down to the energies in between 0 and 0.5 and you slice your way down, so this, these differences would, they would gradually merge or? Um, that we, for that explanation I'm telling you is that, is that it will just keep going down and that this is two different parts of the sample. Right. It's known from, for instance, newer studies that some superconductors will phase separate microscopically on the nanoscale and having magnetic patches and superconducting patches, and this is perhaps what we're seeing. I'm not, I'm not completely, uh, I'm not completely sure. I'm not, I'm not completely square on this, but it's certainly that something is discontinuous. Uh, so we are actually also, also with Martin, we are measuring at, at, the, at the much lower energies now. Uh, on different instruments, trying to see what we can do. Not in, not in this particular crystal yet. Changing topics. Um, we have in uh, utrophilies, <coughs> it's well known as multiple <coughs> materials, so the, the different order parameters couple, magnetic. Uh, 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 electric and the strain. So we are looking at the coupling between the magnetic and and the strain. So we have here is the main data. This is the photon dispersion curve. Nice photon up here. And we cool the crystal to 2K. This is 100K. So cool it down below the magnetic transition. 
and up comes the spin waves. Spin waves are these guys, and these are the thorns. But see here, there is there is an, an avoided crossing there. Uh, so this is so this shows the coupling between between the lattice vibrations and the magnetic vibrations due to due to the multifluoric nature of electromagnetics. So that's nice in itself. So does this have a specific name? Because like in the uh, Langnet interaction, we call it the polariton. And how do you call this, um, this interaction? Sometimes it's called an electromagnum, but only but but only if they really coincide for a long time. This is actually it's just this particular case. So we, we don't we don't have a particular name. I just call it a water crossing. I, 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 I hate using too fancy words about things that have, that have an easy explanation. Um, however, look at this. There is some extra background here in this Q value, and not at the other Q values. So it gets completely clean, but extra background here. Strange. So we went, we went to, to, to look into that. But before giving you the answer, I have to tell you that that ultramagnet is, is a frustrated magnet. Frustrated means that it cannot fulfill all interactions at the same time. The basic building block is a triangle. Imagine just thinking <coughs> icing spins, this is down, this is up, they're anti-ferromagnetic. So these two are happy. But whatever you do to, to the last spin, you can, you can never make, make both bonds happy at the same time. And here you have a triangular structure, which is which is what it is, in neutral manganese, and the system will have to compromise um, to find a three subnet state where where actually no interactions are happening. That leads to a lowering of the ordering temperature. It's actually lowered by 7.5 from what you would expect from nuclear theory. From just you know, fitting the susceptibility and getting getting the getting the true bias and all that. Um, so, but it still orders. There are some, a few, uh, antiferromagnetic frustrated systems that maybe doesn't order, but this is a completely different and very interesting story that I could tell about some other day. So now we. We study at two different temperatures, just below the ordering transition, just or a little above the ordering transition, but still very much lower temperature than than the relative energy of the interactions in the system. And what we see is that there is a lot of diffuse scattering. So, so this is this is the inelastics, and this is two dimensions of Q space, and there is something that has a hexagonal symmetry. It's very beautiful. And even in the ordered state, at this high temperature, there is a little hint of it. I can tell you that if you cool down, there is nothing. There, there, there are just the bright points and nothing else. And I should tell you that these are some spurions in, uh, that, comes, that, that are understood and, and comes, comes from the instrument itself. So all these. Forget about this. Um, when you then turn it around, which you can do because this is from the new Rita instrument, at the, sorry, from the new Kamiya instrument that has these 6,000 pixels. So we, we shine, we shine in a three-dimensional volume, so I can just flop it around and now get energy and one, one dimension of Q here. And you can see that there are these steep dispersions here going up. There's a lot of fluctuations, a whole lot. Even in the order phase, these are the spin waves, the standard spin waves, but because there is an anisotropy, they, they should have a finite gap. But hey, there is also this thing that really reminds us of this. So there is something, some new excitations. We didn't even invent a name for it yet. But there is a new type of excitations that are not spin waves, that, that live in this system. Sim simply, simply because. Or as we believe, it's because it's a frustrated system. And a little teaser, we have studied four other frustrated, three other frustrated systems and found the same thing. Um, and we have studied a few non-frustrated systems and found no clue or, or no sign of this at all. Can I do it for my own sake? So I'm, when I look at like normal dispersion relations, I'm, I'm 
I'm, I'm thinking of this in that terms, and then I'm expecting things to go not, not straight up because that's yeah. an infinite speed of light or very mm. massive. What, how should I think about vertical lines here, actually? What's in terms of dispersion relations? Is if, there if, a, if, if you turn it into a different language, you can say um, fluctuations at, at all time scales. Okay. That would uh, co correlate fluctuations. Uh, uh, they are correlated and they have. They have the they have the, the anti-flow magnetic periodicity. Mm -hmm. If you convert this width uh, into a correlation length, it's it's of the order of five to ten spins. So it's little clusters that fluctuate at all time scales, but keep the relative orientation. But I, I can I can also hint that if you get above five millivolts, we measured this later, then they actually turn into the normal dispersion relation. So there is a crossover. It's a very strange strange thing. It's also Rather disordered because it's an exercise. So this is some strange thing too. Um, so we we did a very simple simulation. I don't even think it's correct, um, <laughs> but 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 we could rep sort of reproduce the data and 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 we say that this is this is probably the classical analog of a quantum spin liquid. So we could, could call it a classical spin. Okay, I have two things more, and each of them will take a quarter of an hour, so I could skip one of them in the interest of time. What about that? Aiming to finish. So there was something about one dimensional magnets that I would have to skip. Sorry for that. Um, but then I, I've told you a lot about uh, the ancient past and the recent past, but of course, the Future always comes from the past. <coughs> um, so, what does the future bring for neutron scattering? Some of the future lies here, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The Spallation neutron source is, is um, built by the Americans. It took users from 2008, but was really only up to full power in the middle of, of the last decade. So, like 2015, something like this. It's now the world leading place. Uh, it doesn't have the capacity as ILL and Global, but they're building instruments like Crazy and they will soon take over. Together with a similar Japanese uh, project, Day Park, where we have a project together next week. I don't know if you can know. No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and, and we have a common student that will, Christine, that will go there and, and another student to keep us company and, and eat, <laughs> eat the sushi. Um, that was not the point. The point is that Europe, that, that of course Europe has to respond to this. So the Europe can actually plan to build a uh, what's known as European Spanation source, 600 meters long accelerator, shooting uh, shooting protons. So that's that's the new way of making neutrons. Protons into a target of something heavy. You you destroy these nuclei and out comes all the neutrons, 10 to 20 neutrons per event. It's very efficient. Um, it's supposed to run at 5 megawatts, but that's only at 2, that's still a lot of watts. Um, 40 instruments, but start with 15, and it's 10 times brighter than the American or the Japanese one. Um, <coughs> construction started in 2014, should have finished in 2019, but that was much too optimistic. Uh, the next, the, the, the construction period is now extended to May 2025, which actually seems realistic to me. And the investment has also been doubled? <laughs> that was the original investment, and then the, the, the price tag is now around 3.1. <laughs> yes. But that's how it is, right? It's, it's the cost of the standing army. It's, it's, this all goes into service. Um, so it's a collaborative, I cannot spell, I can see. It's a collaborative project, so it's not an EU project, but again, member states, countries, but most of the EU has joined 13, uh, 13 member countries. Unfortunately, not, not Netherlands, but it's not too late to sign. We used to be in a right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were, they were there in the beginning, and then, and, and, or you were there in the beginning, and then pulled out. I, I, people were quite surprised about this. Um, so it's built in Lund, Sweden, which is very close to Copenhagen, so there, therefore I'm very grateful. Uh, but I also had to, I also had to work out. Um, 
And I am in, in the team that's building the bifrost spectrometer. So basically, it will, it's the same as the clear one I, I, talked to, I told you about. It will just have a uh, fact of 1,000 more neutrons on the sample. Thousand. It's going to be completely crazy. Already, already Camilla, as you saw, brought, brought whole new things, whole new life into, into frustrated magnetism because we saw things we couldn't see before. And now we have a fact of 1,000. Uh, this factor does, even if the scattering is weak, but you have an elastic scattering, do you not have the danger that you will put so much heat in the system that, that your crystal starts to melt or do a phase transition? Or? No, the beam heating is very small. Okay. Uh, at, at particular, mm. it, unless you put uranium into your sample or something <laughs> else that, 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 that has a... No, no, but I mean, people do, uh, I mean, Uranium, silicon, two, uh, germanium, two, or, what, or whatever it is, uh, heavy feminine superconductors are well known and are studied. And, uh, and, yeah, and are studied by neutrons, but already now they have to put attenuation into the beam, just like we often do with x rays. Uh, but, but just because the kinetic energy per neutron is so much lower, and basically it all just uh, goes off again. So, so, I mean, the neutron carries the kinetic energy away with it because most of the scattering is elastic. So the beam heating is really tolerable. Okay. I, we, we, we do have, I have been speculating about this. It may be difficult to run millikelvin temperatures with, with this flux, um, but I'm not sure. Mm. But it, it will depend on the sample for sure. So on, 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 on PFOS, we want to, to study quantum materials. It's meant for superconductor quantum magnets, complex magnetic structures. Um, basically, it's optimized for extreme sample conditions because the beam is very narrow. So we can put, uh, this is a cross section of a 15 Tesla magnet once again, but it could also be a future 25 Tesla magnet with superconducting cores. It has very limited angles. We can also put a, put a pressure cell inside as, as we did together in the experiment from Hill, in the novel. Um, so we can study things at like low temperature, high pressure, and high magnetic fields at the same time. Um, there is also also uh, relevant, perhaps perhaps for some of you, that we are building a extremely powerful powder diffractometer that will generate data with something like this, um, and uh, it's, it's known as Handal, and you can know Nordic. Mythology, you will know that Bifrost is guiding, is guiding the bridge, the rainbow bridge, to the world of gods. And sorry, Heimdall is guiding Bifrost, which is the, the rainbow bridge to the world of gods. So, hence the names. And here it is. That that was the site, 2014, when the archaeologists had just left it. Because uh, they needed to es excavate it before we, before we could build. And here it is. Looks like this. The civil construction was ended in, in 21. Inside here is the, the start of the accelerator tunnel, the first 60 meter work now. And this, this is our bottleneck. This is, this is what will limit how fast we can, we can run because it's 60 meters out of 600 now. But the, the further you go along, the, the longer the the longer the elements will be. So it will speed up eventually. This is from this week looking down into where we will produce the neutrons. There will be a big wheel of tungsten here. Uh, turning around, producing the, the neutrons. This is the, the neutron guide in the, in the big guide hole that, that will lead the neutrons from this place and out to the big cluster. Um, How do you guide them if they're not electrically charged and doesn't really scatter? Total reflection uh, from, in particular, nickel has a very large scattering length, and then you can have reflectivity at very low angles. We're talking about less than a degree. But it's, it's a whole science in itself how to, how to do optics when you can only have shallow, very shallow reflections. Very gently. Very gently. And, 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 and I've been involved in this. I can tell you a lot about this, but I think it's not the time. Um, I promise to tell you a few things about the organization. 
So we have we have Danscat, which is the organization of Danish scatterers that go abroad. Uh, we have a we have a grant. It's like uh, seven hundred thousand euros per year that we almost use only for for transporting ourselves and the samples to the facilities. And this is from our annual meeting. There is uh, in general we have uh, about five five hundred people. So it's very very nice to have. It's rather small money that gives a lot of effect across a lot of disciplines. So the, our Ministry of Science was very happy to do this one. And I can only recommend it because it, it, it's really very nice. Um, also, I shouldn't do this very long, but we have we have uh, founded, started a, a so-called lighthouse for quantum materials. I happen to be the PI for that. Um, where we, uh, so the funding is 35 and 35 mega Danish crowns to buy by seven, so it's five million euros. So we can basically employ an associate professor, an assistant professor for postdocs and for PhDs. Split between a number of of of, uh, of parties. These are the these are the leaders. Um, and what we want to do is to do theory, materials prediction, materials synthesis characterization, the advanced studies, and then again back to the series to let them tell us what, what this all meant. Um, and just to flash the highlights, I will not have time to go into the details. There is a small group looking into permanent magnets. Uh, there is a small group looking into functional materials, like the multiple rights I talked about. Uh, also, specific effect could possibly be also topological magnets. There is, we have the superconductor that we talked about, the group is not very big here either. Um, and then there are like quantum magnetic properties and uh, quantum magnets, uh, single molecule magnets, which is, and, and frustrated magnets, highly popular. There's a lot of, there's a lot of participants in this. Um, one of our main aims is also to educate the next generation of neutron users. We are very much focused on, on, on neutrons in our in our collaboration. Um, we are running a few courses, and one course that could be relevant to students from here is we have the, the Nordic Policy Neutron School that has run since 2017. It's paid by the Nordic Research Council. There is actually such a thing. They, they, they don't have a lot of money, but they paid us. And the next time we will run is in September 23. The good thing about this neutron school is that it's it's free because it's already paid by. Uh, so that you only need to pay the, the flight ticket to Lund, to Copenhagen, and then the train to Lund. Um, so, summing up, the future brings power to the ESS. Um, I think I think the ESS will blow away the research field by by three orders of magnitude. Uh, higher flocks, we can do a lot of things we couldn't do before. Either we can do ultra fast, we can do the small samples, or we can just get <coughs> better signals so that we can see things we couldn't see before. Um, just to uh, look to uh, a little glimpse into the future, perhaps is from. From the study that we were doing in Japan last year and will do again next week, is that we were looking with very high energy resolution into the superconductors again, looking at the stripes, and we will suddenly see that they have a they have a lifetime broken signal here. So there is a Lorentzian coming out, uh, changes strongly with with temperature. We have not figured out yet what it means because measurements are not done yet. But this was completely unexpected and perhaps related. To the stuff I, I I told you about before. So when we go to ESS, I really hope that we can we can find out why superconductivity exists in in the cool plates and the mid tides and all this. So uh, we can use room temperature superconductivity. We can generate you know cables to the to new energy islands in the North Sea and what have you. At least I hope so. Um, but at least I hope that you enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. Are there more questions? <laughs> we were not to ask. <laughs>
you're in the park. Yeah, which is very fine. It's it's it's, it's really it's really what we need to keep keep uh, things going. Yes. And maybe a general question there. The question was some connectivity does school grades. So it's 35 years old. <laughs> so it seems a very hard nut to crack. You now imply that it's you coupling with magnetic fluctuations like magnets, I assume they are. Yeah. So um, what are the carriers of because usually in magnons you have I know them from magnetic supplies, and after that position has a magnetic model. Because in good grades you have a partial charge of copper, that's from I assume the magnetic model is on copper ions. But only very small fraction of the copper is charged. So what are those magnets? How do you yeah. They, 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 they are definitely short range magnetic fluctuations. I would see them, although I'm not a theorist, but I would see, you know, the spin, the spin and the charges, of course, both on the electron. So it's the same particle giving the spin and the charge. Usually we see them as being separate, but of course they are not. They are within the same particle. And, uh, and then all the particles behave in a very correlated manner. It's, it's extremely challenging to find out what's going on, but 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 there is a number of theories, in particular by Duke Scalapino, who has of, of which 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 basically, you know, uh, hunts down by Green's function theory how this could work, and, and and I will not go through this simply because I can't. But the discharge seems to be shared with many different components. Um. Yes and no, because you can see from X-ray scattering, you can see that the charge, the charge forms these stripes. So they are localized in, in, in two dimensions, but, but they still have, have the third dimension. But, but, it, but again, they are completely localized. It, it, it's like a slight mixture between order and disorder or, or, or short range correlated order, which not too, uh, not too distant from the picture I paint from, from the frustrated man. It looks very much the same. And then in this last slide, you show that you see this effect between 2 and 8 Kelvin for the lens and the rate, with this tail, this effect. But the, the superconductivity could in fact is much higher. Oh, but what I didn't say, or <laughs> forgot to say, is that, is that we, are, we are into we are 5% doping, which means we are just on the edge of the phase diagram, okay. on the very edge. It's, this was. We measured superconductivity in Netherlands, somewhere in Netherlands. In Groningen, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we saw that, that that this is so marginal that there is 2D superconductivity, but not 3D superconductivity. So we, so hence the very low temperature. But good question. It's a more a question of principles. You say, okay, we have now a thousand, we'll get so whenever the ESS is done, um, a thousand factor um, yeah. resolution or or of, of, I mean, just just sheer number of newtons will be up by a factor thousand on some instruments. There are other instruments. So this is this is the, this is the, the bifrost type yeah. instrument. There are other instruments where the gain will be lower. Right. So so the question is, you know. Since the ITT conundrum has been around for quite a while, what is it that you expect? I mean, maybe not what will be the solution, but like what details is it that you expect to be able to see that will be crucial to? Okay, there is a some rule for magnetic scattering for, for magnetic neutron scattering. If you this is a dynamic correlation function, you sum that up over all hues and energies, and you basically get uh, the, your number of spins times s, s, s times s plus one. That's it, in suitable units. Um, but we are nowhere near having seen all the mechanisms. We can sum up only a quarter. There is something that's hiding there in the background that we can't see yet. Until recently, now, now I have to go back, if I can, far back to my superconducting example. Perhaps it's too far. Which is also why we're after this very low energy fluctuations, <coughs> which you can see with the resolution of the Japanese instrument, because there is a clear discrepancy between the muon data and the most known neutron data. Like there's sort of an unaccounted, uh, unaccounted for. So yeah, we're like, yeah, yeah. This is 
this is not exactly the summer but very much related. It's, it's, it's a temperature thing. There is a temperature. Uh, <laughs> so the nail temperature appears different in neutron data and in neuron data. And that is weird. But then when you think about it again, it could be a question of time scales because they measure different time scales. Uh, it, was, it was this one I was after. For a very long time, you could only see this as, you know, quite weak peaks where basically the background of the signal were the same height. And then you go to a new instrument with 10 times the flux, and suddenly it just bangs up. And this is this is what my whole career experience experience has showed me that for this for these for, for these type of neutron experiments where the flux is really almost a limiting factor, each time you get an order of magnitude of flux or in capacity, you see completely new things that you didn't expect. So perhaps I'm perhaps this is also a bit of wishful thinking, but I just I just I've always experienced that better instruments gives rise to something you have you have not expected. So um, I think my much of my <laughs> science career has been about serendipity. Put things into the green and then trying to understand understand what comes out. I didn't have uh, hypothesized very much before, or if I did, it was almost wrong. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Call it a day.